The static over the speaker spills into this Friday. They will try again at noon after Representative Kevin McCarthy suffered a stinging 11th defeat in the race for House Speaker. The House hasn't seen a struggle like this in more than 100 years. And ask 100 people what's behind that struggle, you will get 100 different answers. Joining me on the morning show for his take, FSCJ political science professor Daniel Cronrath. Good morning. Good morning, Bruce. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you being here. So I read this article last night in the Washington Examiner, and the bottom line was becoming House Speaker should be a cakewalk. And this drama is not dysfunctional. It's not embarrassing or whatever anybody else wants to call it. It's democracy. What's your take? Well, it's very interesting. You know, I think that it's while this does make interesting political theater, and I understand why uh, a lot of the party's leadership and a lot of <coughs> rank-and-file members are probably really disconcerted by this, if you are a member uh, of the 10, 15, 20 percent of your political party, and you are given an opportunity to flex some policy muscle, flex some, uh, flex some political muscle, this is the time to do it. I mean, the, the one thing I would say for people who are like, oh, this is terrible, this is going to wreck the party, Washington, D.C. has a very, very short memory, Bruce. In a few weeks, they're going to be settled in. McCarthy will be in. They'll have their committee assignments. But then the things that this small minority is extracting from leadership right now will not go away for the next two years. So in terms of this being a political tactic, uh, I, I think it's going to work out very well for these folks if, in fact, they can hold, get the concessions they want, the committee assignments, those keys, key committee assignments to the Rules Committee, the Appropriations Committee, which give them a lot of power within the chamber to push through legislation that their base voters want to see. So the Democrats had a situation, and you and I chatted about this through text a little bit sure. earlier this morning, and they resolved it much differently. Does this showcase a, a leadership vacuum in the GOP? Well, it, it, it could very much. I mean, Nancy Pelosi, obviously, uh, you can say anything you want to about Nancy Pelosi, but she had a masterful way of herding the cats within her own party. You remember AOC and a lot of the Democrats on the squad came in with a lot of momentum, a lot of policy positions that they wanted to push. And Pelosi brought them in line so much that they are literally now united around Hakeem Jeffries, who's the guy who campaigned against the squad. So if you think about that versus what's going on on the Republican side, it, it, it could be that there's just a, a leadership vacuum. It could also be that folks like Representative Gates and others were watching very, very closely the power that they figured out they could wield. Because as most Americans thought until 2000, this isn't as if, you know, if you don't vote for McCarthy, that Hakeem Jeffries is going to become speaker. That's not the way it works. No Democrat's going to be jumping over and voting, uh, you know, for, for the, the other party's uh, uh, leader's pick, speaker pick, correct? So uh, I think that's kind of where we're sitting right now. So this is interesting, too. Uh, President Biden and Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell made a rare joint appearance Wednesday at a bridge in Kentucky in a display of bipartisanship that offers a guide to how the White House hopes, and I use the word hopes, to govern in months to come. Despite that, you have the House's most militant GOP members front and center defining the party. Will that undermine the ability to get anything done on Capitol Hill legislatively? <laughs> I mean... What gets done typically, uh, you know, I, in this political environment right now? I think so. But I also think that you're going to see an opportunity. Uh, a lot of the things that this small group uh, that the Freedom Caucus is fighting for within the Republican Party are going to be things that are going to be interesting to watch and they're going to be popular with the American people. For example, there are on the people on the left and right of our politics who have been wanting term limits for a very long time on Congress. One of the things the Freedom Caucus has promised is bringing that to a floor vote in the House of Representatives, which we know, I mean, in terms of bipartisanship, pretty much establishment political figures are not going to want to impose term limits on themselves. But there are people on the right and on the left of our political spectrum who are very much in favor of term limits. So I think what you're going to see is you're going to see other things which are going to be brought up to our vote. I think that there are going to be uh, names counted based upon who we're seeing actually vote for something like term limits, not vote for something like term limits. And then in two years when these folks run again, look for the results of that vote. Now, if nothing else, during the midterms, let's go back to November, we learned that Trump-style politics was not what the electorate wanted. But that's what we see playing out in this attempt to elect a House Speaker. Is that going to prove pariah for the GOP come 2024? Well, I, I, sure. I mean, I think it's going to be, I think they're going to have a very, very animated, uh, a, a very, very uh, wound up base ready to come out, whatever percentage of the electorate you want to say that's at, 35, 40 percent of the electorate. And then it really comes out to a turnout game. OK, uh, when Democrats can do a better job of actually turning out their base and they find a reason to motivate their voters, Democrats are going to win elections. Now, if Trump is on the ballot himself, that is the only motivator you're going to need for a Democrat living in the United States. They will come out to vote against this president. If it ends up not being uh, 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 President Trump or President Biden, which is what we're seeing right now, then those dynamics can change. But certainly 
um, a lot of the, uh, uh, the far-right positions of the Freedom Caucus are going to be only attractive to members of their base and not appeal to a broader electorate. And if I heard you right, and I think I did, you said you think McCarthy will ultimately win the Speaker's gavel. Um, he's made a myriad of concessions. He's on a short ledge here. Will he be able to be effective? Well, I think so, because again, I think I, I'm going to just go back. He's going to be as effective as he's going to be able to be, given the small margins within within the chamber, okay? Uh, I think that in very quick order, once these concessions are made, you're going to see it become very much the team sports that we're familiar with now in, in the House. You're gonna see a, a narrow Republican majority trying to craft legislation in which they can, uh, you know, get, all, you know, get some, some moderate Democrats, perhaps, to come in and to vote for them uh, on legislation. So, but, but to be clear, I think, you know, one of the things that the Freedom Caucus has also said is that they want a change from the heavy-handed leadership or speakership style of Nancy Pelosi, okay? So it's very interesting in the fact that we're accusing McCarthy of not being a strong leader, yet the folks who are arguing against him don't want a strong leader. They want to have decentralized power or less centralized power from the speaker's office. In the meantime, everybody's walking a tightrope like Carl Walenda, I guess. We'll just That's have to wait and see. That's correct. Appreciate you being here. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks much. We'll be right back.